Welcome everybody to our webinar on Exercise Physiology and Rehabilitation and NETS. It's so fantastic to have Associate Professor um, Dr Lainey Cameron and Dr Nigel Quadros along to um, share their experience and expertise with us. Um, welcome very much also to all of the Unicorn community who have joined us from around Australia. It's really fantastic to have everyone on board tonight. Um, so we're going to have two presentations. Dr Nigel Quadros is going to um, kick us off. Um, and then we'll hear from Lainey. And then we'll have some um, time for questions and answers. So on that note, I'm going to welcome Dr Nigel Quadros. Um, so just introducing Nigel. Um, Nigel's a specialist in rehab medicine and he's currently working at the Queen Elizabeth and Royal Adelaide Hospitals um, in Adelaide. He works in inpatient care and day rehab settings and mainly looks after patients post stroke or new amputations or those with complex neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, um, post-polio syndrome. His main interests are in the fields of stroke and frailty in the elderly population and he's actually currently working on a, um, establishing a cancer rehabilitation service at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. So Nigel, we're so um, uh, happy to have you along. Thank you, uh, Kate, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for asking me to uh, speak tonight. Um, uh, I'm a rehabilitation physician, and as I said, my interests are in, in stroke and neurology, so why cancer? And the question is, most people would know about rehabilitation services for stroke. Um, some people might ha have suffered a stroke, or you might even have family members who suffered a stroke. And when they've had that, had a stroke, they've ha they have a very good pathway where they have the medical treatment and then they put through a rehabilitation program whether that be inpatient or an outpatient facility and there's a continuation of rehabilitation care by a multidisciplinary team for them. Um, such a system is not really uh, streamlined well in cancer and more importantly in neuroendocrine tumours and so I thought I'd present to you some of the basic principles of rehabilitation which could apply to cancer in general and more particularly this particular type of uh, 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 cancer condition. So, sorry, I'm just... Uh, yeah. Okay, so if we uh, look at uh, neuroendocrine tumours, we're all aware that they come from endocrine cells within the different organs in the body and uh, they're mo mostly common in the, the gastrointestinal system as well as in the lung and there are a few other places like the thyroid etc like that that they can, they can um, uh, be involved in. But if uh, we look at it, there's a very interesting article for those who like reading papers by uh, Dr. Desari and colleagues uh, which was supported by Novartis. Novartis is uh, the big chemical company that uh, makes the uh, sandostatin uh, octreotide analog which uh, some people, most, some of the people might be on, uh, you know, on a regular basis for treatment of carcinoid symptoms. And this is a, a large survey that was done uh, on uh, uh, between uh, what's it call it uh, between 1973 and 2012, and they looked at the epidemiology of neuroendocrine tumors. And the questions they asked were: Has the epidemiology of neuroendocrine tumors increased over time? And in this study, where they had 64,971 patients, they found that there was an increased incidence, a 6.4-fold increase between 1973 and 2012, and mostly the early stages of tumour. And the conclusion was that survival from neuroendocrine tumours have improved, especially the distant gastrointestinal ones and the pancreatic tumours as well. So what the conclusions was that neuroendocrine tumours incidence are increasing in incidence and prevalence, but this is not because they're becoming, I believe, more common, but it's because we've got better diagnosis of these tumours nowadays because we've got better uh, technology both from terms of biochemical, molecular levels and also imaging. So we pick up these tumours earlier and we have better therapies. So what that means, of course, is people are not only being detected earlier with neuroendocrine tumours, but the burdens they cause are more profound and people are living longer and having to suffer with the burdens associated with neuroendocrine tumours. So if you look at the next slide where I present, it's another paper, uh, again sponsored by Novartis, but written uh, looking at the diagnosis, experience and burden of neuroendocrine tumours. And here it was done, a survey was done, a worldwide survey. Most of the patients who participated were from the United States. 
And the key findings uh, were that 73% of people who had NETS reported that it impacted on the quality of life. And the most common symptoms they had was general fatigue, muscle weakness, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and flushing. And these certainly impacted a lot on them. A lot of them made dietary changes as well as they stopped or cut back their physical activity, so they became weaker, uh, more depressed, more frustrated. It impacted on their working life. Many of them reduced their working hours. Some were even forced to retire early, which led to a considerable financial burden, uh, particularly when you have loss of income. As we all know with neuroendocrine tumors, there's lots of investigations, lots of treatment, lots of time taken to actually reach a diagnosis. And a lot of people have lost a lot of time in work and also become frustrated, affecting not only their own personal life, but also their partners or family life as well. So if we look at, uh, uh, there is a large gap in actually rehabilitation of these particular group of people and all cancer patients to treat these symptoms of fatigue, um, uh, you know, weight loss, muscle cramp, etc., like that. If you look at a cardiac patient, um, someone who's had, say, a heart attack or has had a bi cardiac bypass surgery or an angioplasty, there's a really good rehab program available. Every single hospital, whether public or private, has a cardiac rehab program. And there we have, and it has a well-defined four-phase program. For so phase one, there might be an inpatient, uh, where they might have a short stay as an inpatient, or they might not even need to be in this phase. And then they go through uh, three, four, uh, phase two, three, and four, which is different stages of rehabilitation provided by a multidisciplinary team of team of people that involves medical, involves physiotherapy, occupational therapy, dietitians, exercise physiologists, a variety of skilled people trained or specialized in looking after people post a cardiac event. And so they have a good long-term follow-up. What happens to the cancer patient? So in the cancer patient, the oncologist may or may not screen a person for multiple organ impairments. Unlike cardiac disease, uh, particularly neuroendocrine diseases are more complex because it doesn't only involve the heart. You know, it involves multiple systems of, of the organ systems in the body, and it presents in very different ways. And sometimes the uh, the oncologist or treat or the medical practitioner just refers you to a, um, a home fitness program. They says, "Oh, well, once you recover, just go and do exercises, go and join a gym, etc., like that." Okay. So the medically supervised multidisciplinary team is lacking uh, uh, for the cancer uh, patient. So what is cancer rehabilitation? I think cancer rehabilitation is medical care program that should be integrated through the oncology continuum. So from the time of the diagnosis of the neuroendocrine tumor right up to the actual treatment, whether that be surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, a combination of all of these, and the ongoing maintenance of the patient should have an involvement with a, a specialized rehabilitation team. And these are people who are, who are trained to look at the physical problems, psychological problems, and cognitive impairments. And the advantage is that we have a multidisciplinary approach where we have different uh, uh, professionals from, uh, of different backgrounds coming together and looking at the patient holistically and as a whole person rather than a person who's had uh, surgery and chemotherapy and that's it. Okay. And the aim of rehabilitation, whether it be cancer or stroke or anything, is to restore function, reduce symptom burden, and maximize independence and improve quality of life. And certainly we do that for stroke patients, for heart uh, attack patients, and why not for cancer patients as well? So, uh, like I said, uh, the survey I presented, but also most cancers, the three main things that people have problems with is they have fatigue, they have pain, and these lead to what we call deconditioning. So with fatigue and pain, you reduce your activity, you stop exercising, you, tend to, you may overeat, you may uh, have lots of problems where your physical strength reduces, your joint range of movements re reduce, you end up having bone loss, but ultimately also you get problems with anxiety, depression, because it's a vicious cycle of inactivity um, uh, leading to uh, a lot of problems. And of course, what, the, what does that do? It leads to uh, reduced productivity and your general functioning in society um, as a person. So uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about cancer-related fatigue. So it's both physical, 
emotional and cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related more to the cancer, the actual cancer, like endostatic neuroendocrine uh, tumor or its treatment. And people often find that they need to rest longer, they, they are weaker, they can't do activities, simple things like going to the shops, uh, going to the, uh, you know, the cleaning the house, cooking, all of these sorts of things. Uh, if they're working, they find they're reducing their concentration, their short-term memory, uh, attention, ability to multitask. All of these things are affected. And this leads to frustration, sadness, irritability, which not only could affect them, could affect their work colleagues, their spouses, and the whole entire family uh, and social network. Okay. Now, uh, this diagram here I'm, I'm presenting is quite a busy slide, but I'll try and go through it. It's really we're trying to work out what are the causes of uh, thank you uh, causes of cancer related fatigue. And if we look at first of all, there are medical causes, and that's related to the tumor itself. Okay. So, for example, people could have anemia, which is a low blood count, and that could lead to tiredness because you've got l less oxygen and blood supply to your organs. There's what we call electrolyte abnormalities, so, and that's related, again, some of the cast noise, particularly those involved in the mid-gut uh, who've had lots of surgery, they have malabsorption, they can have these problems. Dehydration, uh, anorexic ataxia, loss of appetite uh, and eating as well. Very rarely they have blood clots uh, and other problems like heart failure, etc. like that, okay? So that's mainly the cancer-related problems. Uh, you might have other conditions which impact on your tiredness, uh, at the time of the diagnosis of the neuroendocrine tumor, you might have also had diabetes, uh, chronic obstructive air disease, uh, heart failure, all of these problems which can compound your cancer-related fatigue because they still exist even though you're being treated for the cancer. These need to be managed as well uh, in conjunction with your cancer to give you a better outcome. And of course, there's what we call the atrogenic, which we doctors cause, and that is fatigue related to the chemotherapy we might be bombarding you with immunotherapy, uh, you know, targeted therapies like the lutate therapy some people have, hormonal therapies, and, a number of, and of course surgery as well. Often surgery for neuroendocrine tumors can be very debilitating because large parts of the intestine or other part, uh, organ systems of the body need to be removed to, get, to remove part of the tumor, and this leads to significant deconditioning and fatigue as well. And of course there's the other things that we tend to use, uh, doctors or medications, we tend to use opioids for pain relief, we tend to use uh, beta blockers which to slow down the heart, steroids, all of these things can cause cancer related fatigue. So when a patient presents with fatigue, we need to look at the whole factors which could be causing because some of these can be treated and reversed. Okay, so we should screen them all for fatigue. And also, uh, there, are, there are very interesting uh, quality of life questionnaires that are available, which I think most rehabilitation centers have, and they should certainly screen the, the patient for uh, fatigue and then act upon it. And what we can do is we can look at some of the treatable causes, and this is where the medical aspects of rehabilitation comes in, and that is that if, for example, somebody has anemia, well, a simple blood transfusion, iron infusion, something like that might help correct that. Infections with appropriate antibiotics, if you've got ongoing grumbling fever, simple analgesics like Panadol, Paracetamol reduces the fever, might reduce the fatigue as well. Okay, hydration uh, for people who are, have low appetite, loss of weight, not eating well, well, we can give them high protein supplements, look at their nutrition, get involved, a dietitian involved. Uh, from a multidisciplinary team who can look at improving the calorie intake and therefore maybe reducing their, their um, uh, fatigue as well. Sleep disturbance is very important and then again we can look at the various different forms of improving a person's sleep as well. And of course uh, very commonly you find that people with the, especially the uh, mid-gut uh, gastrointestinal tumors tend to have what we call electrolyte imbalance. So there are salts in the body like calcium, potassium, magnesium, sodium, all of these lead to muscle cramp, fatigue. Uh, calcium is very common because you can get loss of calcium from your bones, particularly when you're inactive. You might also have metastatic tumors that are, are actually gone to the bone and cause calcium loss. And this causes fatigue, cramping, nausea. And we can correct that by a number of different medications, fluids, etc., like that. So these are the treatable causes. If you can treat these, fatigue will become far less.
and reduce it as well. Now, the, the other very important part of physical therapy, uh, sorry, uh, cancer fatigue management is what we call the non-pharmacological therapy. And this is where I think a multidisciplinary rehabilitation team is, is very beneficial to the patient because we can provide a lot of information, support and education to the patient. We, uh, we can refer to the physiotherapist and also to specialized exercise physiologists who my colleague will talk a little uh, much more about this area after me. The occupational therapists who are very important as well to teach people about after me. The occupational therapists who are very important as well to teach people about energy conservation techniques, how to conserve your energy when you're tired and still do activities, your daily activities, give you aids, for example, uh, you know, aids to, if you're having problems bending down and wiping your toes, there are toe wipers, there are sock aids, there are aids to put your legs up into the bed when you're getting in. All of these things that could be problems when you've suffered your cancer, you've had surgery, and you're now weak. Okay. There are a lot of psychological interventions. There are, there, there, there are um, psychologists on, on, on a multi smooth team who look at the impact of cancer on, on yourself, and there are different behavioral therapies they can uh, institute as well to help the particular person. There's also dietitians, like I've already mentioned before, who can look at your nutrition and hydration. And we, um, we also, um, you know, encourage, we don't discourage any alternative therapies such as meditation, yoga, relaxation, all of which helps you as well. Then, of course, there are, the, uh, as medical people, there are a few medications we can use in, in, in places where there's quite severe fatigue and one can't really, uh, uh, you know, treat them from the basically non-pharmacological methods alone. Sometimes we use corticosteroids, uh, dexamethasone is common. They, they, they use more commonly in brain-related tumors, but in, in rare conditions they can be used for neuroendocrine tumors as well. And very rarely, even though uh, I don't recommend these, but people have used them, is things like methylphenidate, which is uh, the common name for that is Ritalin, and most people would know Ritalin is something that they use for uh, ADHD or overhyperactive syndrome. And there's another one called modanophil, which uh, tends to, modanophil is a medication that's used for a condition called narcolepsy, where people fall asleep all the time. And again, we can use that, but we tend not to try and use those unless there's severe fatigue. And then, of course, antidepressants as well can help in, in some circumstances. So there's the medical aspect where we can correct some of the medical problems that I mentioned before. There's the pharmacological and, of course, the non-pharmacological treatment, which is probably the crunch that which is where we really like to concentrate more in the rehabilitation program. Okay. Now, the other problem, of course, I mentioned is cancer pain. Now, pain, there are two, there are three basic types of pain that occur, and all of these don't occur singularly, they can occur in combination, okay? So, nociceptive pain is what we call that that's caused by tissue injury, the actual injury itself. So, and we define that into uh, somatic, which is, involves the bone, joints, muscles, aching, stabbing, throbbing type pain. And this is fairly common as well, uh, you know, post-surgery, uh, you might have been lying uh, on one particular part of your body, the muscles become weaker, and you develop this sort of throbbing type of pain. And the second pain, I think, which is quite common in, in uh, the um, uh, neck sufferers is the so-called visceral pain, and that's due to the bowel uh, kinking, obstructing, um, you know, uh, not moving properly, the bowel actions uh, of food and, and, uh, and feces, all of these causing this sort of uh, visceral stabbing, gnawing pain, crampy pain, as well as you can get pain from the lung and liver if you've got tumours uh, depositing around there. There is another pain that's present in cancer patients, and that is called neuropathic pain, which is what we call a nerve type pain, where you've got this electric shooting type pain which can occur. And this can occur also again after major surgery where you've had nerve damage, or after certain chemotherapy agents as well. This is a very difficult pain to treat, and a quite a burden, and causes a significant amount of burden as well. And also there's the psychological or psychogenic type pain that's that's uh, present as well. So these three types of pain need to be recognized and treated appropriately. So what do we, um, the causes of medicines, uh, common pain is again bone, uh, bone metastasis. So when you get, uh, if the tumor from the neuroendocrine uh, uh, system, whichever it may be, let's say it's from the midgut, which is the most common, goes to the bone, it can cause pain related to that. 
if it goes into the soft tissue, like your mesentery, which is the, uh, the surrounding your intestine, etc., like that, it pulls on all the blood vessels, can cause problems there. Very rarely it can go to the spinal cord or it can go to the bowel. And sometimes what happens is that if it's metastasized or spread to the bone, it can cause a fracture to your bone and that can be causing pain. So it's very important to, if you have bone pain, to actually get assessed by a medical practitioner to exclude a fracture because this fracture needs to be treated straight away. Okay? And then, of course, there's the side effects of the, the medical side effects, like I said, radiotherapy, hormonal therapy, post-surgical as well. And the other problems of cancer pain is immobility, constipation, and very rarely you can get blood vessel disease as well. So these are some of the things that we need to be aware of when we are talking about cancer pain. So again, non-pharmacological methods are the best way to initially approach them, and therapeutic exercises are very important. But it's very important that it's guided by a physical therapist specialized in treating or recognizing cancer-related pain and the comorbidities. So there's no point suggesting to you to go and do radical uh, physical exercise which can actually damage if you've got uh, bony mets or anything like that. You need to be aware of what type of exercise to do and that again is best prescribed by a physical therapist who is specialized in this area. Um, hydrotherapy we, we find is very good as well and there are certain contraindications to hydrotherapy. Again, uh, that is uh, dealt with by a physical therapist. Sometimes uh, if you come to the, the multidisciplinary rehabilitation clinic, getting simple things like canes, crutches, or products, you might have uh, problems with walking which can cause fatigue, pain. You might have a foot drop after surgery where you had nerve damage and giving you a simple orthotic to be able to walk better improves that as well. And our physical therapists also use a number of combination of things like heat, cold, vibration, ultrasound. All of these things can be used in different areas of the body and muscle to try and alleviate pain as well. And finally, lymphedema, which is more common in breast cancer, that's a whole area of treatment as well. Some people with neuroendocrine tumors can get lymphedema, swelling in their limbs, particularly in the lower limb. And again, there's good therapy available to treat this as well and help improve the quality of life. Okay? So, from a medical point of view, what we do is we try to treat the pain. So the most receptive or the one that caused the tissue damage, we try to use simple things like Panadol, paracetamol, and anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, et cetera, like that. Then we go on to the next stage where we might add uh, something which is what we call an opioid, a stronger pain relief, like endone, tramadol, et cetera, like that. And then very later on, when we can't control the pain, we try to go into morphine, fentanyl, etc., like that. But to try and avoid doing the third phase unless it's very, very um, severe pain that the patient cannot manage. And those neuropathic pain, the nerve type pain we use, most common medications called NDEP, which is a tricyclic, what we call antidepressant, affects certain chemical pathways in the brain. Or we use another one called Cymbalta. And a lot of people now are being put on a very good agent, which we use called Lyrica or Pregabalin. Um, or, and another one called Epilim. Now these are used to treat epilepsy, but we find that they also damp down the electrical activity in the nerves and give very good relief of this neuropathic burning shooting pain because this neuropathic pain tends to be worse at night and reduces your sleep and therefore causes more fatigue as well. So there's some of the uh, sort of a medical approach uh, that we can use and it's available to, to patients with cancer-related pain. Okay. Now, deconditioning. Deconditioning is a combination of fatigue and pain and occurs after a period of inactivity or bed result, bed, bed rest, sorry, and results in decreased muscle mass, weakness, and a general functioning decline. And you might have mild deconditioning, and that's after you, your treatment. You might have problems with walking, running, swimming, or even exercising. Or it might be moderate, where you're having more, uh, more problems doing your basic physical activities, and severe when it affects your, uh, your self-care, et cetera, like that. And it, this grade varies depending upon what degree of treatment and in, impact it's had on your, your basic condition. So uh, what are the systemic effects of deconditioning? So uh, muscle strength decreases, that 1% to 1.5% a day to about 10% per uh, week. You get loss of strength in the lower limbs more than the upper limbs. And what that means is you have problems standing, walking, climbing stairs, etc. 
You get muscles shortening. So if you do nothing, you don't do any exercise, your muscles, your muscles actually shorten in their activity and you end up getting joint contractures, etc. like that, which can cause problems as well. You can also lose calcium from your bones and causes osteoporosis or thinning of your bones. And the result is you can get what we call fragility fractures or you can fall and have with small or low impact, you can fracture your bones and have problems related to that. So that's all related to inactivity and deconditioning. Okay? And in cardiac, what happens to the heart, you get fallen blood pressure and increase in heart rate when people rise to a standing position. This leads to the people becoming lightheaded and faint and inadequate blood supply to the brain. Okay? And also you can get uh, the increased risk of developing blood clots. Okay? And the most important thing with deconditioning is that the cardiac response or the heart activity in response to exercise reduces. So you, you basically become more unfit and your heart cannot cope with increased act exercise activity. And therefore exercises need to be designed to try and re, uh, to, sorry, to, to take into this, in, in, uh, this cardiac problems into account and uh, design appropriate exercises where you're not overstressing the heart system but yet benefiting the, 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 the body as a whole. And of course, there's also um, a, a respiratory effects. So coughing or taking deep breaths might be painful because you've got a uh, spread of cancer to the ribs, or you might have had cancer in the ribs, it's, uh, in the lung itself, where you've had major surgery to the chest or abdomen. Okay, so this re results in reduced oxygenation to the lungs. You get increased secretion, increased pneumonia. So again, we need to develop exercises which are involved in uh, breathing and improving lung function to overall prevent deconditioning and, and its consequences, okay? So exercise, which is going to go, uh, go a lot more detail in the next talk. Now, research has found that there's really no harmful effects of exercise on patients doing cancer moderate, with moderate exercise. But, and it's also shown that it reduces 40 to 50% of fatigue in patients, okay? And there have been very good studies done on cancer uh, related to uh, breast cancer and cancer of the colon or large bowel and regular exercise and physical activity by supervised graded methods has actually shown to reduce the recurrence of the, the cancer and also improve the quality of life, okay? And exercise helps benefit not only muscle strength, joint flexibility and general reconditioning as well. And it should involve what we call a cardiac a respiratory program, also a strengthening exercise. And so an overall a good program specific to the patient and their condition and their physical problems will improve basically their general quality of life. So really, uh, what I'd like to point out is that people with neuroendocrine tumors are surviving longer because we've got better detection these days and we've got far better treatments. And these treatments are leading to better survival, but you still have a lot of impairments or disability that are associated with your surviving person. And certainly rehabilitation can help with some of these problems as well. So uh, if what rehabilitation can, can add is reduce the mobility, reduce medical frailty, the so-called deconditioning, hopefully improve the quality of life and distress to the um, uh, cancer survivors. There was a large review recently done by the La Trobe Sports Society where it said it's concluded that only 0.5% of cancer survivors have access to an education and rehabilitation exercise based program. And the barrier to that was really uh, the, uh, the treating team. So they found that if you had a proactive uh, active oncologist or surgical team who re uh, refers people to rehabilitation, then the outcome is far better. And I think that's what we really need. We really need uh, uh, our medical teams, my colleagues, to liaise with rehabilitation teams and involve us in the treatment. So if I could look at the can uh, uh, flow diagram that I've presented, is that this is the cancer care continuum. So you have your cancer, whether it be nets or any other thing like that. If you do nothing, you can get cachexia, muscle, uh, uh, just generalized weakness. Again, no treatment, no physical activity, muscle weakness, muscle wasting, and can lead to a condition called sarcopenia, which is, uh, which is a loss of muscle strength and muscle function. All of these things lead to general deconditioning and debility 
uh, debility of a patient, reducing the quality of life and survival. Okay, so with medical treatment, if we have rehabilitation as part of that, we can then hopefully regain some of the independence uh, uh, in your quality of life and, and improve your quality of survival. Thank you. Thank you. Penny. Thank you so much, Sajal. I really do appreciate you um, you presenting that information to us. I just found that fascinating. One of the things that um, really stood out to me in that presentation was um, the, the the multitude of factors that contribute to people feeling fatigued. Um, right. You know, and it really uh, emphasised to me the importance of really careful assessment because obviously the treatment and the management of that fatigue will. Um, very greatly on depending on what's actually causing it. So it was so fascinating. Definitely. And I just, um, it's interesting that there's obviously a very strong recommendation there um, to uh, have um, the role, the input from a health professional um, in mm. regards to that. I'm actually wondering if I can actually ask our participants a question at this point. Um, and particularly around exercise, um, and the question is, um, have you been recommended to exercise in relation to your cancer diagnosis? So it's really about, um, you know, has your doctor or your health care professional recommended that you see either a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist or even going to a gym, you know, do some regular exercise um, in relation to your cancer diagnosis? So it's interesting. I've seen a few, um, a few people responding there, much more, um, many more people saying no than yes, although it's small numbers, but that probably does sort of line up with, with my experience talking to people too about um, what they've been told. And I think, you know, sometimes our focus in the oncology setting is really around making the tumours behave themselves and um, sometimes I think that really important quality of life aspect can be, um, mm. can be overlooked. But also I think the medical profession um, are really only just kind of twigging to the fact that actually this can make a really big difference. Um, not only in terms of quality of life, but perhaps in terms of disease outcomes. So, really interesting. Um, so, I'm just going to close that poll. And and thank you once again, Nigel. We really thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Really do appreciate you um, sharing that information with us. I'm going to welcome Lainey um, back to us. So, Nigel, I'll get you to pop your webcam off, and Lainey's arriving with us. And I'm going to pop Lainey's presentation up on the screen, and um, we'll all disappear and let Lainey. Um, share her expertise with us. But before we do, um, I'm just going to introduce Lainey. So Lainey is an, ex an accredited exercise physiologist and a registered osteopath. Um, I have to come clean with you with Lainey in that um, Lainey and I have been friends um, for probably 25 years or longer. Um, so she's, she's not only a respected colleague but a really um, a fabulous friend of mine and we're really grateful um, to Lainey for logging in from Queensland. Um, so not only um, a, a, a clinician but also an academic. So she's been a lecturer and clinician since 1995. She's actually got two research degrees um, focused on clinical research and education and has um, academic roles with a number of universities both here in Australia and also in South Africa. Um, so Lainey uh, currently works in a, a variety of roles in, co in a consultancy capacity in academia and board work as well as clinical exercise physiology practice. Um, she's an exercise, ex, the senior exercise physiologist um, at CPEX in Brisbane, and the clinical work really focuses around um, orthopedics, rheumatology, and um, chronic disease management, um, and also optimization of function pre-surgery. So Lainey serves on the um, ESSA Accreditation Council, and the ESSA is the ex oh no, you can you can tell me what that means, Lainey, because I can't remember what the acronym is. <laughs> exercise um, and Sports Science Australia. Thank you. Perfect. Um, but she's also a sessional, and I didn't know this about you, Lainey, until tonight, but a, se a sessional member for the um, Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, serving on an, ad on an as needs basis for matters involving allied health practitioners. Um, she's also been the lead editor of a, of a textbook, um, which is Clinical Exercise, a Case-Based Approach. Um, so she's currently planning a revision of this text to capture recent advances in the scope of exercise physiology practice. So as you can as you can hear, um, Lainey's very well equipped to share with us this evening and we're so grateful 
to you for donating your time and, um, and sharing your expertise with us tonight. Hey, I had a couple of disclaimers at the beginning. So while you're looking at bringing my slides up, I'll, uh, I'll include some useful information. I, I wanted to wholeheartedly agree with Nigel that, uh, that a constructive, supervised exercise and rehabilitation approach should be part of what is offered to people with cancer as part of their routine care. And there's actually a groundswell of, of movement around that amongst allied health practitioners, particularly amongst exercise physiologists. Um, if any of you are on Twitter and you're, you're into following people on Twitter, then can I strongly suggest that you follow Dr. Prue Cormie at the Australian Catholic University. Uh, Prue is a, is a researcher in exercise in cancer care and she is one of the drivers behind uh, this movement to include exercise and, and supervised rehabilitation as part of cancer care. Um, she today was uh, launching ExMed, uh, a, an exercise medicine uh, network with GPs to get GPs involved in the prescription of exercise as part of routine cancer care. So uh, as we saw from the poll, uh, it's not necessarily something that's front of mind for your GP when, when a, a patient has a first diagnosis of cancer and there's uh, lots of work being done to try and change that. And look, it's been lovely to be able to give uh, my colleague Dr. Pru Cormie a bit of a plug because my confession is that I'm not a cancer expert at all. Uh, I'm a clinical exercise physiologist and I, I came into exercise physiology from musculoskeletal rehab as an osteopath with an interest in rheumatic diseases particularly and from that have broadened into chronic disease management. So some of that is cancer care but I'm not, I'm not a cancer expert and, and Prue Cormy certainly is. Uh, this cover photo of a book here on my first slide is actually the front cover of the, the textbook that I'm the lead editor on. And Kate mentioned in her introduction that I'm planning a revision. One of the things that's missing from this book, which was first published in 2011, is a section on cancer care. Uh, it, when we put the book together initially, um, there wasn't a lot. Of, uh, it, when we put the book together initially, um, there wasn't a lot of exercise work going on in cancer care and there's been a real groundswell in this space in the last 10 years. Um, so much so that now I'm looking at my textbook going it's out of date and we need to update a chapter on cancer care because it's a notable omission. I've also very recently signed, I, I had been doing some contract work with the University of Southern Queensland and I have just signed on an ongoing appointment with them. Uh, so that means I will be leaving some of the other sessional and consultancy roles that Kate talked about earlier. Uh, so there you go, that's the disclaimer. My question for you, and I'd, I'd love to have some feedback through the, the chat box, is what do you think of when you think of exercise? What's that word mean? What's exercise look like for you? When I Google exercise, I get lots of images like this of seemingly healthy, well people uh, going out to play. And there's lots of sunsets and beautiful bodies and I wonder if that's the image that you have of exercise or is it sweat and tears and punishment? Okay, so we've, uh, thank you. I'm getting some lovely feedback there that it's movement, mainly walking, that it's gym or aerobics. It's, being, it's also being tired and then feeling exhausted after exercise. Okay, or oh, that exercise looks like football training, working hard. Thank you. That's a really useful place to begin. If I know a bit more about you, then we can tailor this to suit. I wanted to introduce you to something called the National Physical Activity Guidelines. Now, these are 
current recommendations by the Australian Government, agreed on by uh, health practitioners and evidence-based, so based on what we know from research, recommendations for how much exercise Australian adults should be doing. So the recommendations are that any physical activity is better than none, that most of us don't do enough activity. So if you currently do none, doing something is better than doing nothing. Start somewhere and build up. And to be active on most or preferably all days of the week and to accumulate 150 to 300 minutes of moderately vigorous activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity or a combination of those across the week and to do muscle strengthening activities on at least two days of the week. Now that sounds like an enormous amount of activity and it is. Those guidelines have been our national guidelines since 2014. Prior to that, the recommendations were for 150 minutes of moderately vigorous activity on most days of the week. Prior to that, roll back 20 years, the recommendation was you've got to find 30 minutes a day or 30 minutes three times a week. So the Life Be In It campaign was based around finding 30 minutes um, 30 minutes every day, 30 minutes a day, and then before that it was 30 minutes three times a week. What we've seen over the last three or four decades is that it, that exercise hasn't been enough. Australians as a population are getting bigger and less fit, more sedentary, and that's um, contributing to a substantial national burden of disease. So these guidelines are for everyone. They're, um, regardless of disease, they don't take into account any individual special circumstances. These are broad sweeping recommendations for the Australian adult community. So if you are aged between 18 and 64, this is generally what we would say you probably need to be doing. And the reason we, we ask people to do more now than we did 20 years ago or 30 years ago is because we do less in other ways in our lives now. We use a remote control to turn the television on. We use a remote control to open our garage door. We spend a lot of time in our car and we have a car each instead of sharing a vehicle amongst a family or using other forms of active transport. So we get less incidental activity and we need to consciously make up for that with uh, planned intentional physical activity. That's not an easy thing to do and it's not an easy thing to do when you have no disease. So exercise is generally good for us. I'm going to take a minute to give a very brief physiology lesson on what happens to tissues in the body when you do different types of exercise. When we do aerobic exercise, and I don't mean aerobic dancing, I mean exercise that makes you huff and puff, that gets your heart rate up, gets your breathing rate up, but you can keep doing. So it's whole body, large muscle group over and over and over again. So that's walking, brisk walking, jogging, cycling, any of those large muscle activities that you can do over and over again but make you huff and puff they produce, that exercise produces um, a training effect on the heart, the lungs and blood vessels. It makes your heart bigger, it makes your heart a more efficient pump, it um, actually makes your lungs take in more oxygen and expel more oxygen, so it makes your lungs much more efficient and it makes your blood vessels more elastic, so they open up when they need to and they shrink down when they need to. If you do resistance training, that is working against weights or against some kind of resistance, a theraband or the resistance of water or your own body weight against gravity, that type of exercise particularly benefits muscle and bone. It makes muscle bigger, muscle grows in its cross-sectional area, so muscle actually gets wider and it makes bone more dense. So it lays down more calcium into bone, so it makes bone stronger and muscle bigger. 
If you do load-bearing exercise, actually impacting or jumping against gravity or loading, loading your body against gravity, so running, jumping, hopping, hurdling, skipping, that particularly benefits bones. It makes bones more dense. It also benefits ligamentous tissue. So ligaments bind bones to bones. And ligaments are tensile tissue. They're not very stretchy, but they respond to load-bearing activity by actually increasing their tensile strength. So you can make ligaments stronger as well as bones stronger with particular types of exercise. If you do flexibility exercises, so this is stretching, yoga, range of movement activities, this benefits muscles and tendons and ligaments, not so much by making them, making muscles bigger or ligaments stronger, but by making muscles longer and the tendon, that is the bit that attaches muscle to bone, by making that longer and increasing the um, load-bearing capacity, the tensile loading of tendon and ligaments. Um, if you do balance activities, and balance is a, a trainable thing, right? if you do balance type exercises, then um, your balance responses actually improve. They become better as a, a learned response. And that helps prevent falls. So there's all sorts of general benefits of exercise, and they exist in all of us. And they exist in all of us regardless of whether we have disease or not. So these, you still have the same tissues and they respond in the same ways to exercise. What having any chronic disease does is perhaps um, slow down the rate of response, make, your, make it harder for you to actually do that sort of exercise, complicates your ability to exercise with things like fatigue and other side effects. But your body still responds to exercise even when you have a disease. And a really important message about exercise is that it actually needs to challenge you. That training effect, that response of tissues to training happens when something is challenging for those tissues. Right? The tissues in your body are alive and they respond to the challenges that you give them. So in order to get a training effect, we need to sit in that space between what you can do and what is challenging. If we ask you to do too much, then you can't do it, so you won't do it. But if we ask you to do something that's too easy, then it doesn't challenge you and you don't get a training effect. So the expertise of a practitioner like me is in helping you find that space that is the right space to train so that you, you can do it, but you get a training effect. There is a lot of work going on in physical activity and cancer, and I've plotted some of that for you. I, I'm not going to go through all of the studies that now inform our understanding of exercise in cancer care, but I'll give you some snapshots through uh, the different stages of a cancer journey. Pardon me for using that word, but uh, yeah, it, it perhaps is a helpful way to categorise the work that we can offer in different spaces. So in cancer prevention, there's been quite a lot of work in physical activity looking at cancer prevention and cancer recurrence risk. So when we first started doing exercise work in cancer, actually working with somebody who had an active cancer, who was having cancer treatment, didn't happen very much. So we got to work with people who'd had cancer before and were now in remission. Or population studies that looked at how many people got cancer. And so we know a bit about physical activity and cancer prevention and physical activity and cancer recurrence. And you know, there's really convincing evidence now that in colorectal and in breast cancer, Regular physical activity reduces the risk of you getting a cancer in the first place and substantially reduces the risk of that cancer coming back if you've already had one. There's reasonably convincing evidence, probable evidence, 
for prostate cancer and there's, there's possible strength of relationship in lung and endometrial cancers. There's not a lot of evidence in net specifically and I, I have to say that most of the research comes out of breast and prostate cancer. So we're making some assumptions here about how exercise is useful for people with NET based on other cancers. And we see risk reductions both in cancer and in cancer recurrence ranging between 25% and threefold risk reduction, so 300% risk reduction. Um, what we don't know, and there's a lot we don't know, what we don't know is the precise exercise prescription. So I started with the general national guidelines for everyone. We don't have general guidelines for people with cancer. We've got some best estimates and there are some good people doing, doing research in this space so we know more and what we know is growing but there's still stuff we don't know. Um, and we also have a, a now really substantial body of evidence that, that exercise is a really powerful intervention for reducing chronic disease, other chronic diseases. And we have to say some of the improvements we see in cancer studies might be because people who have cancers might also have other chronic and complex diseases that are benef benefiting from exercise. The link I put there is to the Cancer Council uh, web page on, uh, on exercise in cancer and I think that's probably a sensible advice page to start with so uh, it, it's certainly worth a visit. I wanted to just uh, cover a little bit of what you might expect an exercise physiologist to be able to do at each stage along the way and exercise physiologists and other allied health practitioners uh, so you can see on referral from a GP on an extended care plan or you can see privately without any referral at all, do have a role in cancer screening. Allied health practitioners often have time with you that your general practitioner might not. And so they have time to ask good questions and to probe into things that perhaps you didn't come in for and you maybe didn't even think were a problem until someone got you talking about them. Um, but in this way, we're in a space where we can do some work in, in cancer screening and in referring people then for appropriate cancer screening tests. And that's an important part of our primary contact work. Um, it's very rare for an accredited exercise physiologist to be at the forefront of a cancer diagnosis. Uh, I've had to break that bad news to one patient once in my entire practicing career. Um, so it's not, that's not usually where you would find us the day you're getting bad news. But we certainly are people who can walk alongside you during that process of diagnosis of the multiple trips to multiple practitioners. Um, and we do have time to be doing activities with you and alongside you and that creates a space in which we can be an ally for you. We may well ask to communicate with other practitioners as part of your care and uh, that's because it's, it's helpful for us to have that information and certainly the more information we have about you and about what your uh, particular tumour is doing to you, then the more we can modify our exercise plans to, to suit you personally. As I said, we don't actually have good guidelines um, for people with cancer. So we're working from very general guidelines and then trying to make something that fits for you. And so the more information we've got about you, the easier that becomes. We know that the goals of cancer treatment are generally to eradicate the cancer, prevent recurrence, prevent spread and add to quality and quantity of life and particularly exercise is useful in preventing recurrence and improving your quality and quantity of life. Um, we know that there's lots of different types of cancer treatments and so it's 
helpful for us if you can tell us what treatment you're having and how it's making you feel, how much of it you're having. Uh, and we can certainly work with you to vary plans to fit with cancer treatment. There's a growing body of evidence that having that doing exercise even during cancer treatment is beneficial. And as I said, when we first started working in cancer care, that was pretty scary for lots of oncologists to let us near their patients having chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, and get those patients exercising. But there's a growing body of evidence that actually you are more resilient to chemotherapy. You will respond better for it and decondition less if you do exercise even during chemotherapy. Uh, and just having chemotherapy can decondition you very substantially. So doing some exercise during that time is really helpful. Um, I have, I'm have i working with a, a patient at the moment. As, as Kate said, most of my work is in surgical preconditioning now. So this particular woman had a, a primary breast cancer. She had surgery, she had chemotherapy, she had radiotherapy. She wasn't recommended any exercise at that diagnosis and treatment stage. Um, she was told that after the um, after the chemotherapy and radiotherapy was done that she would be able to have a breast reconstruction. She gained a great deal of weight during her uh, chemotherapy, deconditioned very substantially, so lost a lot of muscle mass and some bone mineral density, but gained a great deal of weight. And then when she went for her um, uh, pre-surgical workup for the uh, reconstruction, breast reconstruction, she was denied that surgery on the basis of her, her obesity. So she's actually come to see me for weight loss. But I feel, I feel like she's been poorly done by. If she'd been offered the opportunity for exercise during cancer treatment, during chemotherapy, um, perhaps she'd be better off now. Um, Fortunately, you know, the body's eminently changeable and so we can still do good stuff with her. But um, I would like to see people being offered exercise during cancer treatment if they want it. I know that you get loads of different side effects with cancer treatment and some of them are awful. And, and I want to say to you loud and clear, we can, absolutely we can exercise during that time and we as exercise physiologists can modify exercise prescriptions to work around your side effects. We can modify exercise programs to deal with vomiting. All right? Uh, seriously, you can, we can work an exercise program around, around vomiting, around constipation or diarrhea. Uh, yeah, it's not too hard. I wanted to include a little note on interval training, which is one of the current trends that you will hear talked about in exercise, particularly high intensity interval training. Interval training just means alternating types of exercise, alternating intensities of exercise, alternating forms of exercise, alternating one exercise for another. It's not new. It's suddenly become very fashionable. Everybody's talking about HIIT. That's high intensity interval training. But it's way more trendy than its history perhaps warrants. It's been around a long time. There's some really good things about interval training. And particularly for people with cancer, interval training is really useful for fatigue management. It can make exercise very time efficient. If we take the work that you might do over 40 minutes and we reduce that to 20 minutes by in intervals asking you to work particularly hard rather than asking you to work at a steady state for 40 minutes, you may well find that that's less tiring. It's certainly much more time efficient too, so it's useful for people who are time poor. But it also may be useful in managing your fatigue. I have some patients 
for whom interval training is not high intensity at all. It may be low intensity intervals alternated with intervals of rest. But again, it's the same process. Rather than sitting still, let's break up that period that would be sedentary with small intervals of low intensity activity. Another way that interval training is useful is that it can manage boredom. If you've ever done an aerobics class, an aerobics dance class, it's a type of interval training. We alternate from one exercise to another, sometimes every eight beats of music or so. It means you don't get bored. Um, but it also means you don't get local muscle fatigue, and so you tend not to get as sore, even though you work quite hard over the whole time that you exercise. So it can also reduce the perceived effort that you have during exercise and make it easier for you to stick at exercise, particularly on days when everything's feeling like an effort. If we can break the big task up into little bits and alternate the bits, then perhaps it doesn't feel like quite so much hard work. Another thing I particularly wanted to touch on because it's really important for people with NETS is um, the carcinoid crises that you occasionally, hopefully not too often, experience. Um, carcinoid crises occur when we have neuroendocrine tumours that have quite well differentiated histology. That means that the tissue is quite um, well formed, well shaped and distinguished from other tissues. And it's usually when they've metastasized. So you might have metastases in the liver and a small intestine primary tumour or a, or a mid-gut, um, a colon primary tumour. Um, or a renal tumour or a bronchial tumour or an ovarian tumour. They can actually drop, um, uh, excrete carcinoid products directly into the bloodstream. So with them you don't always need to have met. Um, we know that carcinoid crises can be triggered by tumour manipulation, so moving the tumour around, and, and particularly that happens when you biopsy a tumour or in surgery. It's actually debatable as to whether exercise is a trigger, but let's be careful. Right. Exercise is certainly a stressor on the body. Not all stress is bad. Like I said at the beginning, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. So you have to have some stress to create tissue level change. I would be cautious about um, high intensity and prolonged high intensity exercise. And I would be particularly cautious about exercise that involves combat or collision because of the possibility of tumour manipulation. But this is a, perhaps a theoretical risk rather than a well-documented risk. I'm not sure I'd want to be taking a theoretical risk with my body. The other thing that's important to understand is that a carcinoid crisis can actually look a lot like exercise training. Um, it can be typified by flushing and sweating and tremor, shaking, lacrimation, which is making tears, salivation, so making lots of saliva, and a bit of swelling. And you know, if you exercise hard, in a high temperature or your core temperature goes up when you exercise, um, you can get flushing, sweating, a bit of shaking, maybe your eyes and your mouth run, and, and you, you do actually swell up a bit, particularly your feet swell during exercise if you've got them in a pair of sneakers and you're keeping the heat in. So a carcinoid crisis can actually be confused with responses to vigorous exercise. And so again, I would be cautious with prolonged high intensity exercise because I think then you're in a space where it may be difficult to tell whether you're having a carcinoid crisis or not. So when we're talking about people with NETS, how much exercise and what? Well, the Australian guidelines are 150 to 300 minutes at this moderately vigorous level and 75 to 150 minutes at this vigorous level. What we generally would say now, and this is what Prue Cormy and the ex-med group are suggesting for cancer care, is that 150 minutes a week in that moderately vigorous intensity is important and probably a sensible place for people with, with cancer to look at. 
Um, when we're talking about incidental activity, getting up and getting around, then you know as much as you can manage, and even even fidgeting, even twitching, can be helpful. So be as active as you can be. The other thing that I would take from the the range that's offered in our guidelines is that you can have a plan for good days and a plan for bad days. And on the bad days, maybe you're only sitting at the bottom end of that recommended range. And on a good day, you can do more. Um, don't expect yourself to be a superhero. Doing what you can manage is a whole lot better than doing nothing. In terms of the type of exercise, the first question I ask most of my patients is, what do you like to do? There's no way I'm going to ask you, as an exercise physiologist, to do exercise you don't like to do. You've got enough going on in your life that's unpleasant. You don't need me to be adding to it. I would be encouraging you to find whole body movements that use large muscle groups, ideally something with a friend or in a group, or that has some intrinsic value to you. If you love gardening, I can plan an exercise program for you around being in your garden. Um, I, I remember having a lovely time with a, a, um, an elderly Muslim woman who was a patient of mine who wanted to be able to maintain her prayer routine. And so I built an exercise program around her prayer positions. What matters to you? And we can help you plan exercise around that. So yes, if, you're, if you have a neuroendocrine tumour and you want to exercise, you can. If you feel you can, if you want to, you can. An exercise physiologist or another allied health practitioner can certainly help you manage the logistics. And we've got lots of ideas, lots of ways to work with and around side effects. But you're in the driver's seat. So it's what you want to do and how much of it you feel you can. And we will modify the rest to suit you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lainey. It's, it's Kate again. I'm just coming in. <laughs> yep. um, look, I just, I just want to just want to thank you. Um, I always love hearing you speak. And, and you, uh, one of the things that I really love is how practical um, your approach always is and, and how I always feel like, well, something's possible. Um, when I talk with you about things. So you've done that tonight and I, I just um, once again really thank you for that. I'm going to now bring up, um, uh, well I'm going to hope that Nigel can hear me and he's going to come in with his um, camera and we can start talking about some of the questions that people have um, uh, emailed in and also I can see there's some people typing as well which is really good. Um, so there might be some questions coming through on the text box. And I have got questions for Lainey. So um, uh, the first one is, I have an inoperable neuroendocrine tumour in my pancreas, but also a thrombus in the L neuroendocrine tumour in my pancreas, but also a thrombus in the SMV, which is the mesenteric vein. Will this type of exercise, um, which is bending it, etc., cause the thrombus, which is um, a blood clot or tumour, to spread? So that was one that was emailed in. So Lacey, I'm wondering if you would um, be able to comment on that. Sure. So I, I sent Kate an image earlier that I'd like brought up at this point. Sure. And uh, so if you can, sorry Kate, to give you another challenge. Good. Let's see Good. if this one works. Yes. Okay. So I've just turned my pencil on and I've got the pencil here and I'm just drawing a circle around the superior mesenteric vein. So this image is a horizontal slice through the body at the level of the superior mesenteric vein. So this person's tumour is in the pancreas. Now the pancreas is a deep tissue as it is. It's a deep organ. It's quite well tucked up under the left-hand side of your rib cage and quite a long way towards the back. And then the superior mesenteric vein runs up and terminates behind the head of the pancreas and there it joins the splenic vein and the hepatic portal vein. So you've got a, a tumour in the pancreas and a 
thrombus, the blood clot sitting in here. Um, breaking off a bit of the blood clot is a, is a problem. You get a little bit of clotted blood flying around your bloodstream, it's then going to lodge in the next smallest vessel where it gets stuck and cause a problem there. But I want you to see how deep this vein and the tumour, which is sitting in the pancreas in front of it, are. This is the front of the body here. And this is your spine here and all the muscles of your back. So the problem that we're talking about is tucked away really deep in the middle of the body. Um, and it's almost midline. It's, it's almost an axis of movement for your body. So if you bend and stretch and lean to one side, you actually get very little movement at that axis point. You move everything else around it a long way, but you don't move that tumour and the, and the thrombus very much at all. So bending exercise is probably not going to do um, uh, to create a trauma on either the tumour or the thrombus. And in fact, um, aerobic exercise, that is that whole body continuous activity to get you huffing and puffing, that's particularly useful uh, for re um, increasing the elasticity of blood vessels and reducing the stickiness of platelets and helping manage thrombus. Uh, um, uh, all right. So there's a lot to be said for doing some exercise. I would not necessarily want you having other people run into you. All right. I wouldn't want you playing collision sports. Um, but uh, but bending, stretching, brisk walking, not likely to be doing you any harm and probably doing you a lot of good. Thanks so much, Lainey. I'd just like to ask Nigel if she had anything to add to what Lainey said. Yeah, this is a, a classic problem that you have. And may I, no, I, I think Lani has explained this very well. May I ask the person involved, what triggers on your carcinoid symptoms? And, and what symptoms do you get first of all? Is the person able to answer more at all? No, this was, um, Nigel, this was an emailed in question. Okay, so, well, okay. well, yeah. so, there, there's two problems here. Yes, you've got a thrombus there, but uh, as Lani explained, if you look back at the physiology of, of the, the body, you've got the, the, the large, the small intestine is supplied by the superior mutatory vein, okay, and there's another blood vessel called the splenic vein, and they become what's called the portal vein, which goes to the liver. Now, the, the reason for that is because the nutrients in the intestine go via the superior mutatory vein to the liver to be metabolized to produce all that sort of thing. Why am I saying this? Because the carcinoid symptoms you get are because the blood flow from the superior mutatory vein goes to the liver and produces these problems. Now, you, what you, you get the carcinoid is what we call mesenteric ischemia. That lack of blood supply to your mesentery vein, you get this abdominal pain, this bloating, this flushing, which can be triggered by many things, including exercise. Now, what happens is, if we do very vigorous exercise, such as jogging, sprinting, running, we all know, and Lani would be able to go through this in more detail, but there is a phenomena called redistribution of blood. So when you do a sprinting, for example, there's redistribution of blood from your internal organs like your kidney, your liver, your spleen, your abdomen, to your blood supplying the larger muscles in the arms, the legs, and also the brain to keep them active. That can lead to mesenteric ischemia or lack of blood supply to this particular vessel, predisposing to further thrombus forming. In other words, I think in this particular lady, if she does vigorous exercise like she did before, um, uh, marathon running, that will predispose a carcinoid crisis which she may not be able to detect because, like Lani said, she'll be sweating, she'll be flushing, and she might think that this is all related to my exercise activity. So I would agree, I would say, do not do vigorous uh, exercise. I would do moderate intensity exercise in this case. The reason I say that is that I personally experienced that myself. Okay? So, so this is what I have been battling with. So Nigel, I think um, 
it's just it's interesting because we actually had two emails in questions that were very similar, and I think you might have addressed our second one, which is which is good because it is very similar, um, which was a lady um, uh, who was wondering about exercise intensity, and I think you you've addressed that quite well. So, um, so uh, I think we won't spend any more time on that particular question if that's okay. I'm just going to reread it while we. I'll get um, Lainey maybe to comment. I know that you've just done a written response, Lainey, for um, Edward, who was asking about a round of golf. So I'm wondering if you would mind um, answering that out loud for us um, while I just reread this question that was emailed to make sure we've looked at all of the points. And the, so the question sure. is, um, for those who are, who are watching our video, um, the question was, where does a round of golf sit in an exercise regime? So Lainey, over to you. Sure. So I've responded by saying to Edward, if you walk your round of golf, then it's aerobic exercise. Um, if you walk nine holes, um, then you might consider it intermittent aerobic exercise because you're going to stop nine times at least and hit the ball. Right? But if you walk the golf course, then the, you have the, a similar aerobic effect to if you went for a walk. Um, if you walk 18 holes, that's even better. And it's large muscle, whole body exercise, ideally with friends, and it's fun. So put it in that aerobic um, type of exercise. When we looked at, at the physiology of different types of exercise and their effect on tissue, so good for heart, good for lungs, good for blood vessels, um, and, and just great for you. Keeping connections, being outdoors, being with people that you like. Um, so definitely something you can count in in exercise and aerobic activity across the week. Um, remember that in our national guidelines, there's also encouragement to do strength training at least two times a week. And um, a round of golf usually doesn't involve much resistance work unless you've really got that ball in the rough. Um, so you probably do want to be adding some sort of resistance work to make sure that you end up with muscles and bones that are getting bigger and stronger. Can I make a comment as well, please? Of course, Nigel. Thank you. Yes, I think that's very valid. I think with carcinoid people, the most important thing you need to you need to work out is what triggers your carcinoid syndrome, okay? What are the features of it? And you must ensure that the exercise you do does not trigger that, that carcinoid syndrome. That is very, very important. So I agree, everything is right, you know, the goal, everything is right, but whatever triggers your carcinoid syndrome, exercise-wise, you must draw back on that because exercise can participate if not done correctly. And that's probably where the guidance of the, um, you know, things from exercise physiology should be important. When you talk to them, what triggers on your syndrome? Would you agree with that, Lani? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And that's when I say, you know, the more you can tell us about you and what, um, what helps you, what works for you, what side effects you have, including what might trigger a, a carcinoid crisis. Um, share that information. The more, the more we know about you, the more we can tailor stuff. And the other important thing is don't forget that diet and nutrition is very important part of this diet. And you need to talk to your physiologist to what you eat. For example, if you eat fish and chips and it brings on a, a carcinoid syndrome, you don't want to have a pie or a pasty and then go running or something like that. You know, it's not going to help you. So diet is a very important part of exercise treatment as well, I think, a combination of both. Thank you so much. Now I'm just realising that um, Lane is uh, also multitasking and looking at Mark's um, question about AFL football, and so he's asking about contact sports. Um, we did talk about that. I know, Lainey, you, did, you covered that a bit during the presentation, and I guess the, the concerns about human manipulation. Um, so I might let you keep going with that conversation, but the, just to clarify, in the, the question that was emailed in. Um, so there was a second question that was emailed in that we didn't read out, and it was about a lady who um, it was from a lady who uh, had um, some pain after a long trail run. So this is a, a person who's 
um, enjoyed training for ultra marathons, so you know, a, a really long distance, long, long, long distance runner, but had some um, pain under her rib cage when she went for a long run and, it, and didn't go away. And the doctor suggested that perhaps the exercise may have um, aggravated the tumour um, or possibly caused the bleed, we, and that settled down, the discomfort settled down, but it's still a bit there. So this lady's saying, I really miss running and I walk quite a lot, and I'm unsure about getting my heart rate up whether the increased blood flow um, as a result of higher intensity workout would make my skin worse or cause damage. Um, and also asking about weightlifting and strength training. Um, I don't want to make things worse, but I always also want to stay active and maintain my strength and muscle mass. Um, so I think you've, you've talked about those those themes quite a bit in the presentation, Blaney. Um, uh, but I just wondered if you or Nigel had any further comments to make about that. Um, that <laughs> Yeah, look, the comments I'd make are that that particular person um, really says to me, I would, I would probably want to work with you under some supervision to begin with. Um, in principle, you should be able to get your heart rate up, get your respiratory rate up, and get a really, a really profound cardiovascular training effect without it provoking a carcinoid crisis. But I, I share Nigel's reservation and I don't want that happening when you're not supervised. And so one of the other things that we have up our sleeve as exercise physiologists is the ability to put you through quite demanding exercise tests in supervised environments. Uh, so, um, we can put you on a bicycle or on a treadmill, put a 12 lead ECG on your chest, get some exhaled gas analysis, put a pulse oximeter on your finger and find out what your oxygen saturation in your blood is doing and in 10 minutes put you through a graduated exercise test that takes you from you know, barely walking to the, the fastest and hardest you can go and see what happens to your body in that time. And that all happens under fairly tight clinical supervision. So if there is, a, if there is a, an adverse event, you've got good people on hand to manage it. Much better to do that kind of testing and know than to um, risk running, taking your walking program into a running program on your own and then be out on a trail somewhere have a carcinoid crisis and be stuck. All right? So I think that there's actually a really important place here for, um, uh, for exercise testing as a tool that we then use to inform prescription. I agree with you. And, and that's where I think a combination of a, a medically supervised and exercise physiology com combination is important because if you look at this lady, she started on lanreotide uh, one injection. Now lanreotide is a long acting uh, uh, analog that can basically work by binding to the receptors of the carcinoid tumor cells, preventing them from secreting. Okay, so she's only had one injection. The heart, the, these injections usually last for three weeks. So in the first phase, when she's just had the injection. It, she'll have more receptors that are blocked, therefore there'll be less carcinoid secretion. She might be able to exercise more vigorously. But towards the third week, when the effect of the injection is running out, there'll be more active tumour is able to secrete more, and therefore she, it might be activity that she was doing in week one might participate the carcinoid crisis by week three. Therefore, we need to look at it over a period of time uh, uh, that, that she is, is exercising. And I think she needs a few more treatments. One treatment with lanreotide is not enough because the, the more treatment you get with lanreotide, we know that it tends to reduce the tumour growth. And so again, I think yeah, the key is uh, doing it in a graded and uh, and supervised way is the best way to go, not provoking your partner in whatever that much. Oh, thank you so much, Nigel. And look, I, I'm aware, thank you very much, everybody, for sticking with us, because I know we have got a little bit over time. Um, and, and although I'm sad not to have had our third speaker, actually, it's been really lovely being able to hear a little bit more detail from um, the two experts who have joined us this evening. So we'll look forward to hearing um, from Andrew early next year. Um, but uh, I just I just, just did want to say um, 
there was a question in the text box about finding an exercise physiologist in your local area. The exercise, um, the ESSA website has got a, um, I think a function where you can search for an exercise physiologist in your area. So I'll put a link to that um, both in the email but also in the notes on the YouTube video. So um, people will be able to um, get that. And also there was a web reference that Lainey um, had in her presentation. So I'll make sure that's emailed out to people and available as a link from the YouTube video too. So just um, thank you so much to you both. I think, um, one of the things that stands out to me about this, this evening is the importance of a team um, approach in, in managing people in terms of um, their function, you know, their rehabilitation um, and their, and their um, condition, their exercise and managing things like fatigue. And I think um, that's been beautifully demonstrated tonight by the teamwork between um, Laney and Nigel. And, um, in the face of some technical trickiness as, as well. So, you know, just thank you so much to you both once again and to all of our people who have joined us um, live tonight and those who are watching the video later.